Good evening and welcome to Freedom is a Constant Struggle with your host Key Lunyasha and engineer Arnel Valle. Today I'm very pleased to welcome back to Freedom Raj Patel who's a writer, activist and academic. He has degrees from the University of Oxford, the London School of Economics and Cornell University. He's worked for the World Bank and the World Trade Organization and been tear gassed on four continents protesting them. He's currently a visiting scholar at UC Berkeley Center for African Studies, an honorary research fellow at the School of Development Studies at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, and a fellow at the Institute for Food and Development Policy, also known as Food First. He was recently invited to share his views on the global food crisis in testimony to the U.S. House Financial Services Committee and is an advisor to the U.N. Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food. In addition to numerous scholarly publications, he regularly writes for The Guardian and has contributed to the L.A. Times, The New York Times, The San Francisco Chronicle, The Mall, the Mail on Sunday and The Observer. His first book is Stuffed and Starved, The Hidden Battle for the World Food System. And he is the author of the forthcoming book, The Value of Nothing, How to Reshape Market Society and Redefine Democracy. Welcome, Raj. Well, it's great to be back, Keith. It's so good to have you back. And um, let's talk a little bit about um, Abba Khlali, uh, a shock dwellers movement in South Africa that you've been involved with recently in Durban, South Africa. That's right. Okay. So, so the, the, a, a lot of people in America think that after the end of apartheid and you know, once the ANC got into power and Nelson Mandela uh, was wearing his gorgeous shirts and he was the president of South Africa, um, th that the South African story ended happily ever after. Um, and really, you know, what, what once uh, that's been put out of, you know, what, what once apartheid was over, people felt like South Africa, you know, at least there's one success story. Sadly, um, as you say, freedom is a constant struggle. Uh, sure. And in South Africa, that struggle is going on still. Uh, because initially, after, after the end of apartheid, uh, the ANC government made a compromise with capitalism, with, with the white uh, minority government there, to allow a certain kind of neoliberal capitalism to take over the country. Now, when you let that happen, um, the consequences are that, that South Africa's uh, you know, welfare systems were, were allowed to decay. Uh, and so pretty much as soon as uh, apartheid, fa you know, the apartheid was brought down, living standards for poor South Africans started to fall. Uh, and you saw uh, you, you know, the, the levels of human development, which is a sort of composite index of well-being, um, fell consistently from 95 on. So now it's, it's, it's worse than Palestine. Um, you know, from being you know, pretty much a sort of middle-income country, it's really a disaster. Uh, now, well, what, there is a very wealthy... Uh, ruling class. There's a, there's a tremendously wealthy ruling class, uh, and the, the the ruling class are now called uh, colloqui colloquially Wabenzis. Um, w right. Wabenzis, like people they... who drive Mercedes Benzes. Right, uh, right. And th th some people are doing tremendously well. Some of the richest people on earth are uh, now black South Africans. Right. Um, the trouble is the majority of South Africans remain poor. Um, and one of the consequences of the end of uh, apartheid was that South Africans, if, if you remember under apartheid, that there were these Bantustans, areas where South Africans were not allowed, were, 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 were basically penned up in rural areas. Right. And you needed a pass to be able to come to the city to work. After the end of apartheid, um, people could come to the city freely. And so poor South Africans looking for work moved to the cities, but there was no infrastructure for them. Uh, and so in South Africa now, you have a lot of shanty towns, a lot of right. shack settlements. Um, and it was in one of these shack settlements in Durban, which is uh, South Africa's third city, but the one with the largest slum settlements, that this amazing movement began. It's a movement called Abathlali Basem Jondolo, which is Zulu for people who live in shacks. And uh, they 
basically they, they rebelled because they felt that they'd been betrayed by their government. Um, and they took to the streets and they used tactics uh, that they'd learned through the apartheid struggle. Right? Right. It, under apartheid, there was the United Democratic Front, which was this wonderful, decentralized, um, really sort of autonomous, left-wing um, sort of revolutionary movement. Um, there and were there was a coalition of a, a, a whole variety of organizations uh, some white, some black, some colored, quote unquote, yeah. um, women's organizations, um, just almost the whole left of the country. Right. And, 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 and I think that that's, you, you put your finger on it right there. there. There was no one party line. There was no one leader. There was no one politics. There was mm -hmm. a certain idea of this is how you work together if, you know, no matter where you're from. And it included the ANC. It, but the ANC were, 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 were a little suspicious of African it. African National Congress for those. Indeed. Yeah, the, the, the ruling party, the, the Af well, now the ruling party, the ANC, was a little nervous of the UDF because they couldn't control it. Okay. Um, because they, you know, their role was as an equal partner rather than as a leader. I see. Um, and in fact, you know, since the end of apartheid, the ANC has kind of gone out of its way to rewrite history so that it seems like it was the only show in town. I but, see. But as you remember, um, you know, freedom is also about a, a battle of memory, a, 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 right. of remembering against forgetting. Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, they and rewrite history they real do. quickly, don't they? They do. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, but the tactics that were learned under the UDF are now alive and well in the streets of South Africa. People don't um, you know, don't don't remember. Um, the, the, well, people are not aware that those tactics can continue, and that in South Africa today there are hundreds of street protests happening just this year. Hundreds uh -huh. of street protests in 2006, which is the the last year I remember. There were 5,000 protests in South wow. Africa. We're not getting any of that no. information here. Which is interesting. I mean, I, I'm I'm going to go on a tangent here, but District Nine. Have you heard of this film, District Nine? It's a yes, I have heard of it. Um, it, it's doing very well at the moment, and it's about a spaceship that lands in Johannesburg, uh, and the aliens that are on this spaceship are treated as dirt, and they live in they live in these shanty towns. Now. Outside uh, of uh, South Africa, everyone says, oh, it's a metaphor for apartheid. This is what happened under apartheid. Nothing. It's, it's, District 9 is really about what's happening in South Africa today. The poor are treated as aliens. They are, you know, they, they are, they're penned into these uh, shack dweller communities, uh, and they're treated like dirt. But what's happening in South Africa is that these, these communities are rising up in beautiful ways. Uh, so Abatlali Basim Jondolo has now is now really the biggest independent uh, movement in South Africa. More than 30,000 people across the country living in the worst conditions and fighting to, to reclaim their right to be in the city. Um, uh, you know, to, to finish the, the dream of the anti-apartheid struggle, right. to be able to be equals in the city and to be able to govern the city like everyone else. Right. And uh, how does that, uh, how do they relate to developing food sovereignty in... Well, 